welcome back to another episode of Enjoy the Book of Life. I'm joined with my father once again as we introduce a new kind of episode, People, Places, Things. We're going to trace an idea through the scriptures, and today's topic is the Daughters of Zelophehad. We're going to hit on a Supreme Court cases in the wilderness journey, uh, women's rights to own property, all the way up to the nativity and the birth of the Lord Jesus. So join us for this exciting ride uh, as we travel through the scriptures. All right, we're starting in with a people, places, things, tracing all the way through uh, the scripture. Um, and we're starting with the daughters of Zelophehad. Now, this is probably not a very common topic. <laughs> and so let's uh, just go ahead and jump in because it, do, it does start with kind of an unusual story. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, we, we have one of these genealogies. We have a description in the book of Numbers of all the people that had made the journey through the desert. And uh, that's why it's called Numbers. Uh, not because it's a mathematical book, but it's a, a census taking of the people, one before uh, they made the journey through the wilderness and then one after. Mm. And the interesting thing is that the only two people in both lists would be Caleb and Joshua. Right. But uh, we read here, this is going through now, uh, Joseph's boys and his older boy, Manasseh. And as we go down the line, we come to this man, Zelophehad. Uh, this is Numbers 26 and verse 33. And Zelophehad, the son of Hepher, had no sons, but daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mala and Noah and Hogla, Milka and Tirzah. So, seems straightforward enough. Right. But as soon as we read this, well, it's like this big O-O. Uh, because... Uh, in the nation of Israel, they had one glorious hope. Uh, Jesus was God's hope chest. And all of their hopes were wrapped up in a king priest who would restore the nation, defeat their enemies, and establish an eternal kingdom. And in order for that to happen, um, mamas had to have baby boys. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, you carried on the heritage, and more specifically, uh, it was uh, patrilineal. So the idea was that every um, inheritance traveled from father to son. So, so why why would why is that necessarily the case? I think a lot, especially nowadays, people would look on that in almost uh, in our present culture in a very negative light. Right. So why is this an important thing to, to focus on, especially in this story? Okay. Well, of course, God had his purposes, and we discover as we read through the scripture that the Lord wanted tribal regions. He wanted the tribes to remain distinct. And there were certain tribes that could have dominated and overflown and taken over um, many of these smaller tribes. And so the Lord determined their boundaries and he wanted them to have their inheritance. And in order to do that then, there had to be this patrilineal line because if, for example, a woman inherited territory through her father and then she married a man from a different tribe and they had a son, then that son from that tribe would own territory in his mother's tribe. And pretty soon it would become a patchwork quilt and there'd be no right. sense to anything. And so in order to maintain the tribal distinctions, God set up this uh, patrilineal system. So why, why is it important that the tribal distinctions were maintained? That I would know I am of Asher or of Zebulun or that sort of thing. Well, of course, God uses this idea of the number 12 to establish human government. And so we have um, the 12 months of the year that are based on the lunar passage. And God wanted to give everybody 
uh, a monthly fresh start, so to speak. Uh, then he established the 12 tribes. Remember how actually there ended up 13, um, and so God selected Levi as the, his servants, uh, not numbered among the tribal groups, but then there were the 12. And again, we have the story when we come to the New Testament. Uh, we have the 12 apostles selected, and, and God has this design that goes all the way through to the book of the Revelation, where you have 12 foundation stones, and you have 12 gates to the city, and God establishes this. Of course, it's double the number of man. So mm -hmm. man's number is six, and 12 is this idea of harmony, of cooperation between two, and then it's thrown on the big screen, and it's this whole idea that, that God wants to share the government of the universe with his people. Mm. He wants to include them in the order, the divine order. And so God is a God of order. He's established this. And as I say, uh, the tendency was for some tribes to become larger and more powerful. Uh, Benjamin was a warlike tribe. And they actually, at the end of the book of Judges, uh, they fought off the other 11 tribes all right. by themselves, not once but twice. And so uh, uh, God wanted to set the boundaries so that these smaller tribes would have equal footing uh, in the future of the nation of Israel. Uh, I, I think it's the, the overall principle is true that God recognizes sovereignty, human sovereignty. He, he recognizes the right of property. He recognizes individual rights. That's a big deal to him. And so he wanted to make sure that some tribes didn't uh, sweep over the other tribes and caused them extinction. And in fact, in the book of Judges, this was uh, an, also a big issue. Uh, they almost annihilated one of the tribes. Yeah. And this became a, a deep concern to them, right? So, and, yeah. and, and so we have this, this central idea of, of property, and this, this is central to the idea of the daughters of Zelophehad. Exactly. So, so uh, we just have this record in chapter 26, but when we get to chapter 27, uh, we have these women, and they are heroic. But let's remember that the children of Israel, when they came to the edge of the Promised Land, and they got the report back about these giants, they said, whoa, we're not up to this, you know, exit stage left. Whereas these girls, they're saying, look, we want all that God has for us. These gals are in the spirit of Aksa, who went to Caleb. She was a chip off the old block. And she said, I want everything that God has for me. And he gave her a piece of the Negev, the south, which is desert. And she said, thanks very much, Dad, but, you know, I need some water. And he gave her the upper and nether springs. So um, this spirit of these women, uh, the men are shaking in their, in their boots, you know, afraid of the, of the giants. And they're saying, well, let's not worry about that. Let's get all that God has for us. Yeah. We want to possess our possession. So in chapter 27... Uh, we read, the, and this must have been uh, a very um, auspicious event. It says that they stood before Moses and before Eliezer the priest and before the princes of all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle. Wow. And so this was no little minor conversation. But I think the, the key point here is this, that um, the Jewish people were litigious. You know, they say they're... The Jew, you never have a shortage of Jewish lawyers. Every Jewish family has a lawyer in their family somewhere. And so you can understand that having two and a half million people in a desert without any landmarks, without any road systems, uh, like the, that cow belongs to me, you know, that cow had a calf by my bull, and, and all of the court cases, they were so many that Jethro said, Moses, you're going to kill yourself. From sun up to dark, you're an, you're trying to answer all these questions. You need some small claims court judges that'll help handle the caseload. And Moses did this. And yet, for 40 years in the desert, with all these court cases, there are only two that are recorded for us. Hmm. And they both have to do with the daughters of the Lophad. This is the first one. And they said, our father died in the wilderness. Why should we not be able to get an inheritance in the land just because he died in the desert? And so Moses then takes this to the Supreme Court. 
which is God. Yeah. And God answers and says uh, in verse 7, the daughters of Zelophehad speak right. You shall surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And so we might say this is a big deal for women's rights. It, as far as the nation of Israel is concerned, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, yes, if you don't have any... Now, normally what would happen is if, if there was no male uh, direct in the direct line, it would go to the uncle. But in this case, God says, no, it should come to the daughters. And so these five girls get a piece of inheritance in the land and the failure of their father to trust the Lord was no reason to penalize them when they were prepared to lay hold of this and possess their possession, whatever the giants thought about it, they right. were ready to go in and take it. Right. So that's part one. That's, the, that's case number one. Now we go over a few uh, chapters, uh, chapter 36, and we have case number two. Now time has passed, and it looks like some of the girls want to get married. So they come back to Moses, and once again they ask this question, what happens if we get married? Then do we lose our inheritance? And once again Moses takes it to the Lord, and the Lord says no, they don't have to lose their inheritance as long as they marry within their own tribe. Right, because if they married outside their tribe, this goes back to what you mentioned before with the patchwork quilt. Right. That, and that, you know, if they marry someone from a different tribe, all of a sudden they're going to own parts of another tribe's region. Exactly. Yep. So this, this uh, it occurs here in Numbers. Then it shows up again in the book of Joshua where um, the the land is actually being subdivided to the various tribes. Mm -hmm. And once again, this is outlined. This is this is pointed out. Look, we went to God about this. This is the right way to do things. And these these women do deserve to get this inheritance. Because you can understand at that point, the men would be kind of jostling and saying, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? Are we going to lose our inheritance to the girls, you see? And and the Lord is saying, no, I've, se I've established the basis. It is patrilineal, but if a father dies and only has daughters, the daughters have a right to it. If they want to get married, they can keep their inheritance as long as they marry within their own tribe. So why should these stories, if I'm doing my casual Bible reading or I'm doing uh, some sort of Bible study through the book of Numbers or Joshua and I see this, why should this catch my eye? W what about it? Uh, we've mentioned a few things, but but what is stands out about it that, that should catch my eye in the first place all right well uh, obviously this is precedent case the, these are supreme court decisions yeah uh, this isn't just something moses off the fly saying yeah well, go ahead and give it a try uh, this is something where they go to god and this is a big deal because um we 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 should go to primary principles and what is the primary principle all the stuff about the genealogies it's all pointing forward to the coming of Messiah, mm -hmm. right? So we have to think if this was sufficient to have recorded both these cases and the uh, not only the establishment of the principle, but then the application of that principle in, in Joshua, there must be a good reason for it somewhere down the line relative to the Messiah. Okay, yeah, good. So let, let's go down the line and, and, and see where, where this takes us. All right, so... Uh, when when we come over to Matthew, we have uh, the, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. And this is not the uh, official genealogy, because as we read through it, uh, Matthew points out 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. Oh, by the way, the last one isn't related to any of the above. Right, <laughs> which doesn't seem to be the best way to start a, a bestseller, but um, what he's saying here is that Jesus is the legal son. He's not the physical son, but he's the legal son of Joseph. Joseph is his legal father, and so Jesus is going to get a legal right through Joseph 
even though he's not physically related. So this is how the, the punchline comes. Um, so all the generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David till the carrying away into Babylon, 14 generations from the carrying away into Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. And then we discover that the Lord Jesus is not actually connected. And so verse 16 says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ or the Messiah. So we have this clear line. Now, as we go back, there's another issue, the curse of Jeconiah, which would disqualify Joseph and all his brothers, uh, all his sons, from inheriting the throne. And Jesus avoids the curse on Jeconiah through the virgin birth. When we get over to Luke... So, so yeah. just on that, Joseph was the legal heir to the throne of David. But as you referenced, there was a curse on Jeconiah. And so that seems to disqualify all his future generations. So... God has promised this to David. However, the curse seems to counteract God's promise. Right. But by being the legal son of Joseph, the legal heir, but not his physical son, Christ is able to uh, fulfill the promise to David, but miss the curse on Jeconiah. Right, right, yeah. God had said, Jeconiah, if you were the signet, the, uh, the, the, the kings would wear a ring that had their logo, their trademark, their monogram, and uh, they'd put a dollop of wax on a document, put the seal into it, and that was their official signature. And God said, if you were my royal signet, and of course that's what, what was true, right? That, that the kings and the priests and the prophets of God were like his signet. When God said something... The kings gave authority to it in the nation. But mm -hmm. this man was so wicked, God said, I, I just take that ring off and throw it away. Well, and none of your seed will sit on the throne. The only king after Jeconiah, Zedekiah, was actually his younger brother. Mm -hmm. So none of his seed did reign on the throne. And from that point on, that was it. So if, if the Jews won't have Jesus as their Messiah, there is no rightful king to the seat to the throne of David that isn't under the curse of Jeconiah well, except Jesus well yeah so that's that's what they have to they have to reckon with yep. but when we come to Luke then we have this other genealogy and as we go down the list we discover that um, it, it ends up with Joseph as well all right and so we say now how is this working well, we discover that this is actually Mary's genealogy. Now, the official genealogies did not have any women in them because of this patrilineal system. Um, the, the four women that are mentioned in Matthew, this is a moral statement. This is showing us not so much that these women were sinners. The men were much worse sinners than the women were. Uh, it's showing these four women who lay claim to the blessed hope, right? So you have um, Ruth, uh, you have uh, uh, Rahab, who lays claim to the idea that Gentiles could also get saved. And she asks for a sign, a signet, a seal, something to guarantee it. And she's given the scarlet rope to put out of her window. Uh, and then you have Ruth the Moabitess, and once again she goes and pleads the case there at the threshing floor. And she pleads that Jews and Gentiles might be unified, might be linked together in this hope. And out of this, of course, comes the baby Obed, right? And then you have the, the story of Bathsheba. She actually has to go into the royal bedroom while David is in bed with his little electric blanket, this uh, young girl Abishag. And he, she has to go in to plead the case for Solomon. Now, this is a big deal. Solomon is the representation of the grace of God, right? This couple, David and Bathsheba, this was a, a wicked thing they did, and their little boy died, but then God gives them a child, and they call him Solomon. God gives him the nickname Je uh, 
um, beloved of the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, Jedediah. He said, uh, you can call him Solomon, I'm going to call him Jedediah. And so this is the where sin abounds, grace superabounds. This is a, a, a declaration of this. And, and David's other son, Adonijah, is trying to sneak onto the throne, and she has to go in and plead the case for the triumph of grace. And, and we know how David sets that up so that Solomon is crowned king. So these are, are women who have been disappointed by the men in their lives. Mm -hmm. They're disadvantaged, but they lay claim to the hope. And so this is how it comes through to Mary. So they're included and, and in that line. Similar to what the daughters of Zelophe had done, laying claim to, to what exactly is right. theirs. Yeah. Exactly right. These are heroic women. There's no question about it. And so when we come to the genealogy, we discover that um, Joseph is standing in for Mary. Now that proves certain things to us. First of all, that Mary didn't have brothers. Because if her brothers were living, their brothers would have stood in for Mary. That's what happened. It went to, if, if you were the oldest child and you were a female, then the next, the, the brother would then become an heir, much like they do to, in the British, the British uh, royal family. So um, in this case, we have Mary uh, obviously without brothers, and she's in the official line. Now, she is in the royal family. Her line goes back to Solomon, but it sidesteps Jeconiah. So while she is in the royal family, she's not in the direct line. Right, if like was, Joseph. Right. Yeah. If she was in the direct line, she would have been disqualified because of the curse, or her son would have been disqualified. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but Mary is in the royal family, but she's not in the direct line. The, the second thing we wonder about is this. If it was, in fact, a tax census that caused Joseph to travel to Bethlehem to their ancestral home, why did Mary go along? Right. She right. was nine months pregnant, 60 miles over rough roads. What's the deal? Well, we know, of course, the mega reason is right. because it had been prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But... Uh, from the practical point of view, the only reason Mary would have had to go to Bethlehem for a tax census would be if she had something that was taxable. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that this is explaining to us, based on, on the daughters of Zelophehad, that Mary had a right to an inheritance. There must have been some inheritance that she was to receive, and so she went to register for that census even though she was nine months pregnant. Now, we see with uh, John the Baptist, for example, that his father was from the tribe of Levi, but his mother was a cousin of, of Mary, and therefore she was in the tribe of Judah. Whereas here we have both Joseph and Mary in the same tribe. That was the requirement necessary in the second case of the daughters of Zelophehad for a woman to keep her inheritance once she got married. Mm -hmm. Then we have to ask ourselves the question, what was it that Mary inherited? What was it that came down through that line that would have been uh, the Lord Jesus simply as a Jewish male? What was his right of inheritance simply as a Jewish male? Now, uh, Schofield, who traveled through the land of Israel before all of the tourism, he said there were three things that Jesus would have inherited simply as a Jewish male. One was the throne in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He said the second one was the inn in Bethlehem. <laughs> uh, Boaz, being the mighty man of wealth, would have provided a place for people to stay. Mm -hmm. um, whether it, that was the case or not, or whether it was actually the inn of Chimham, uh, which is another story itself, uh, I don't know. But uh, the third thing, which I think is quite clear from Scripture, is that when um, Joshua took the land, for some reason he left a little uh, area near and around Jerusalem in which uh, a group of Canaanites continued to live. 
it was called Jebus. Jerusalem was called Jebus, and Jebus uh, gave its name to these Jebusites, right? And if Joshua had taken that territory, it would have been subdivided among the family of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. Right. right. And uh, and then no one could have bought that, right? The, the, the right of ownership was such that even if you lost a piece of land through debt, it would return to your family in the year of Jubilee. Now, you remember how Achan, um, we have the story of... of um, uh, King Ahab trying to buy Naboth's vineyard, and he couldn't buy it. Naboth said, sorry, I know you're the king, but God gave this land to us to perpetuity. You can't have it. Right. And the only way they got it was by not only killing Naboth, but all his sons, and then right. absconding with the territory. But uh, but generally speaking, it carried on through the family. So... Um, when we come to the times of King David, David, there were three things he wanted. He wanted the Ark of God to have its rightful place among the people. He wanted to have the city of the name, the city where God had placed his name, the city of Jebus, renamed Jerusalem. And he wanted to manifest the character of God by finding someone from Saul's family and showing them grace. And mm -hmm. we have the story of Mephibosheth. So, God um, had placed his name on that city, but here it was still a, a Canaanite stronghold. We know the story how Joab found the water system, climbed up, opened the water gate, the army went in, and took the city of Jebus. Okay, years go by, David sins in numbering the people. He looks out through the, the city, uh, the, the palace window, and he sees the destroying angel standing on the top of Mount Moriah to the north cries out to the Lord for mercy. The Lord says, you go up there and offer a sacrifice to me. He purchases the temple mount, uh, the precincts for the temple, on the, the southern tip of Mount Moriah, um, pays for it in silver uh, to the man who owns it, Ornan the Jebusite. Uh, but then we read that he bought the rest of the mountain for a price in gold. And that was his family's inheritance. Now, because it belonged to a Jebusite, he could buy it. Right, right. And it be belongs to his family. It would have fallen, again, by Jewish right, down through the line until it came to his heir. The only man who qualified to be David's greater son was Jesus. And therefore, that piece of land, if the Jewish law had been followed, would have come to the Lord Jesus through Mary. That piece of land is where Calvary is. So when we read he came to his own and his own received him not, the first his own is people, and the second, uh, pardon me, the first his own is neuter for things, and the second his own is masculine for people. He came to his own things, and his own people received him not. So Calvary is the place where he came. This piece of real estate was his by creatorial right but it was also his by Jewish law through Mary, and that's why the daughters of Zelophehad and their cases are significant because it gave Mary the right to inherit that through King David, and we have all the clues given to us in Scripture if we can just put them together. Yeah, and that's, that's really what we're looking at here. It, when we look at people, places, things, tracing things through the Scripture, seeing those connection points, and seeing that big impact at the end to see the, that this story way back in Numbers that might be easily breezed over is actually going to lead to a grand climax uh, and, and to discover truths about, about Christ's lineage, about his inheritance, and about Calvary, the place he died. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, very good. Well. I, I always enjoy going through these and realizing that in the end, nothing is minutiae. Everything is important, right? Yeah. And the Lord Jesus said, uh, the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the Yod, or the smallest stroke of a letter, the, the tittle or the tail, is more important than the whole rest of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> the universe might pass away, but... 
not not one detail in the word of god will pass until it's all fulfilled yeah it makes you hungry to start digging <laughs> yeah right. well good